Greetings, my friends, and welcome back to our Bible study, God's Perspective When Life Hurts. I don't know about you, but I'm raring to go and excited to begin this journey with you. I've been praying for you and trust that God's Spirit has brought you here today with a heart ready and eager to hear from Him. So let's spend a moment in prayer and commit our time into his hands. Oh, Father, we love you. And we come to you today eager to hear from you. Would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see you for who you truly are? And captivate us with your glory so we leave here today changed and more determined than ever to trust you in every area of our lives. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. I want to begin our time today by asking a rhetorical question. Why start our very first lesson with the theme of being captivated by the greatness of God? What does God's greatness have to do with suffering? And why would I choose to start here? Why start here? Because contrary to what we might think, being captivated by the greatness of God is actually the first step in reconciling the idea of a loving God with the reality of human suffering. Why? Because an amazing transformation can happen in the midst of suffering when we recognize that this great God is not only with us in the light, but he enters into the dark places with us as well and gives us a stunning opportunity there to come to know him like we've never known him before. If we are captivated by God's greatness, we'll be able to trust that he is in everything that comes our way. This will make each moment a sacred opportunity to come to know him deeper if we will but seek him instead of doubt him in our darkest hours. Another reason why we start with the greatness of God is because most of us don't. <laughs> Rather than focusing on his greatness and on the honor due his name, most of us focus on ourselves and what God should do for us. God doesn't want us to embrace him only because he will meet our needs. He wants us to seek him and trust him in all of life's circumstances, even when we don't feel his presence. If our focus is primarily on what God can do for us, suffering will never make sense. Why? Because if we feel that everything is all about what God can do for us, as long as everything is well, everything is going fine, we're at peace with him. But as soon as tragedy strikes or hardships come, we'll become frustrated with him, even angry. Like a genie in a bottle who did not come through for us as we thought he should, we'll wonder, where is he? Why doesn't he answer us? Why isn't he meeting our needs like he's supposed to? Perhaps you're thinking, doesn't God desire to meet my needs? Well, yes, of course he does, and always will according to his promises, but we must trust him to do it in his way, in his time, and according to the greatness of his wisdom. You see, Resting in the greatness of his control means trusting that whatever happens in our lives will ultimately fit perfectly into his eternal love-based plan. How would things change in our lives if we truly embrace the fact that God is the ever-living, ever-present, 
an ever acting one who upholds all things by his powerful word. And that because of who he is, our relationship can only be one of unceasing, absolute, and universal dependence and trust. You see, we need only to look back to the origin of our existence to acknowledge that we owe everything to God. Man's chief care then, his highest virtue, and his only happiness now and throughout eternity is to present ourselves as an empty vessel in which God can dwell and manifest his purposes. So again, I ask, how would things change if we truly believe that God, the I am that I am, the maker and sustainer of heaven and earth, the one who was and who is and who always will be, is indeed in complete control, using even human suffering for an eternal purpose that we will one day understand perfectly when we see him face to face. You see, if we truly believed in his greatness and in the greatness of his perfection, we'd be able to trust him no matter how much life hurts. Rather than doubt him or hold him suspect in times of adversity, we'd bow before him and say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I am your humble servant. Let it be done to me as you see fit. Only then will suffering begin to make sense. Only then will we begin to see things from God's perspective. You know, sometimes we can easily see God's purposes in life's adversities, right? But sometimes we can't. Sometimes we'll have to endure years of suffering and heartache before we ever see anything good result from it. And other times we won't see his purposes at all until we meet him face to face. But still we're called to trust him no matter what. A couple weekends ago, Craig and I ministered in a church in York, Maine, and stayed with a very dear woman. I want you to listen to her story because it beautifully illustrates our need to trust that God is at work in our lives, whether we see it or not. When she and her husband were first married, she told me that they were both your typical New Yorkers, you know, cynical and hardened by life circumstances. But then through a series of events, this woman came to Christ. And when she did, she said that God did an incredible work of softening and healing in her heart. But unfortunately, her husband remained as cold and, and hard-hearted as ever. As a matter of fact, she said that the more Christ changed her, the more angry and belligerent he became toward her and toward anything that had to do with Christianity. Thus began the next 26 years of what seemed like hell on earth for this woman. She told us that he was so verbally abusive and angry that she often felt unable to survive another day without literally losing her mind. She wanted to divorce him many times throughout those years, but every time she moved in that direction, God told her to stay. He told her he wanted her to endure this suffering for his name's sake. And so she stayed for 26 long, grueling years. And then one day, her husband was diagnosed with cancer and given only a short time to live. For the next several months, she took care of him, but he continued to be as angry and belligerent as ever. But then one day, only six weeks before he died, he began to weep as he told his wife how sorry he was for making her life so miserable. 
He told her that he wanted to receive Christ because now he knew God was real because of how he had helped his wife endure so many years of suffering his abuse. She said that she was so shocked by what he said that at first she thought he was making fun of her. But soon she realized this was no joke that on his deathbed, he wanted to make amends with her and with her God. She said he was deeply repentant and that as soon as he confessed his sins and received Christ, he became a totally different man. He became loving and kind and gentle for the first time in his life. So... For six short but blessed weeks, they enjoyed sweet fellowship together. And then he passed away. She told us that so often she wanted to escape her suffering because she really didn't believe anything good could ever come from it. But she truly believes that her husband is in heaven instead of hell today because she chose to stay and endure the suffering God asked of her. So it all comes down to this. Will we believe that God is who he says he is? Is he wise enough to know? Is he a supreme enough to decide? Is he loving enough to allow only what he knows is necessary in our lives? Will we trust him? and be so captivated with the beauty of his greatness that like Paul, more than wanting to escape his suffering, will want to come to know him in it. In Philippians 3, 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to him in his death. So this, my friends, is why I chose to begin our study with the theme of being captivated by the greatness of God. It is because I believe that is where we all must start. To help us better appreciate his greatness, I want to spend the rest of our time looking at a marvelous passage found in Isaiah 40. In it, we'll see two aspects of God's character that we'll need to hold on to tenaciously in the midst of suffering. So let me read this passage for you. Isaiah 40, 10 through 14, 18, 21, and 22. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust by the measure? and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and with whom did he gain understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. What can I say about this passage? God is just so awesome. The word awesome means to inspire awe, respect, fear, and deference. It is to recognize someone great is in your midst. 
The only one we can truly ascribe the word awesome to is Almighty God. Hebrews 10.31 describes it best when it says, it, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, that perspective of God is a far cry from the attitude we so often have, isn't it? And yet, through it, though it is true that he is the awesome one, worthy to be feared, he tells us in Matthew 10 not to be afraid of him. Why? Because he's the one who knows even when a little sparrow falls to the ground. And he declares that we are so much more valuable to him than the sparrows. He also tells us that we are much more valuable to him because he has even numbered the hairs on our head. So while he is an awesome God, worthy to be feared, because of his love and tender care, we do not need to be afraid. Okay, so let's look at Isaiah 40 in more detail now. And as we do, I want you to ask yourself the question, who is the God I know? Do we see him as a genie in a bottle, only part of our lives to give us what we want? Or is he someone infinitely precious to us, whose greatness we honor no matter what, and whose love we seek even in our greatest struggles. Let's look at how God's word describes him in verse 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will carry the lambs and carry them in his bosom. These verses are so interesting because they, they keep switching back and forth between God's very different aspects of his character. Let's look how God's word describes him in verse 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather his lambs and carry them in his bosom. These verses are so interesting because they keep switching back and forth between two very different aspects of God's character. In verse 10, we see God's greatness. We see him strong, coming in military might and justice. Yet we notice that this all-powerful one comes bearing not only recompense and, and justice, but reward as well. Then, without warning, the image of the all-powerful one changes drastically in verse 11. Instead of being depicted as a mighty warrior, he's now seen as a kind and gentle shepherd, tenderly caring for his lambs and carrying them in his arms. And yet we know from this passage that the gentle shepherd is indeed the all-powerful one. And the all-powerful one is indeed the gentle shepherd. They are one and the same. These verses then describe something we must never forget about our God, and it is this, that power and all the manifestations of power, such as justice, authority, supremacy, and majesty, all originate and flow from the heart of our God because he himself is the all-powerful one. We can say the same thing about his love and all the manifestations of love, such as gentleness, tenderness, grace, compassion, and kindness. They also all originate and flow from his heart. You see, we understand love when we understand God, for God is love. 
It's interesting then to notice that these two aspects of God's character are depicted as God's two arms. Two very different aspects of God's character, yet they function like our two arms in perfect unity. In verse 10, we see God's all-powerful arm. And then in verse 11, we see his kind and loving arm, a gentle arm that carries the weak. One arm is so totally buff that no one can doubt he rules and reigns in might. The other arm is so totally nurturing that every single one of us can find safety, comfort, and peace in those arms. So, my friends, this is our God, who with one arm is mighty and powerful, demanding holiness and justice, but who with the other arm tenderly leads and guides his own. Let's take it a step further now. Who is the God I know? Let's look at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? In this verse, it is though Isaiah had no words to truly describe the enormity of God, so he decides to do so by depicting the size of God's hand instead. Perhaps he thought, if I could just describe the size of God's hand, maybe that would shed light on just how incredibly huge our God is. The first thing we see in this verse is that when God created the world, he measured the water of the earth in the hollow of his hand. Now, isn't that amazing? I want you all to look at your hand. This is your hollow. It is estimated that there is approximately 912,500 cubic miles of water on the face of the earth. It's like stacking water mile upon mile upon mile 912,500 times. And that's what God can hold in the hollow of his hand. Then the scriptures say he marked off the heavens by the span. A span was a common measuring tool used in Bible days and is the length of the tip of your thumb to the tip of your baby finger. Now, I have a really small span, but I want you to notice what this verse says about the size of God's span. It says that he marked off the heavens by the span. Wow, now that is one big hand. Next, it says that he calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills on a pair of scales. Doesn't this amaze you? <laughs> Not only are God's hands big, right? But he apparently works on a pretty huge scale as well. Can you just picture him? in a creative moment, forming just enough soil to scatter upon the face of the earth. Then perhaps he decides to add interest to the topography of the earth by forming the mountain ranges. Perhaps he created the Rockies and placed them on this side of the scale. And then Perhaps he creatively spoke into existence the great Himalayas and laid them on this side of the scale. Can you just imagine him carefully placing these mountain ranges where he thought they would fit in most majestically? Listen, my friends, one of the countries my husband and I have ministered in is Nepal. The first time I flew over the Himalayas and heard the pilot tell us to look out the right side of the plane to see Mount Everest, I want you to know that I was shocked because there was Mount Everest, not down below us, but straight across from us at around 28,000 feet. Now, that's one tall mountain, and yet that's what God placed there with his hands and weighed 
on his scale. Don't these verses make you feel tiny? <laughs> I hope they cause you to realize that there is absolutely no problem too big for the one whose hand palms the universe. The next few verses make us keenly aware that God really does have everything under control and really doesn't need our help or permission to guide and govern the world as he deems best. Let's read verses 13, 14, and 18 together. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? In other words, I think God's saying, if you understood, truly understood who I am, you would realize that when it comes to how I direct the people and events of human history, I don't need your permission, nor do I need to explain all the whys of everything I do. You see, my friends, he's the creator, and we're the created, not the other way around. Then, as though that were not enough, Isaiah continues in verses 21 and 22 and says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. It's like God is trying to get our attention in these verses. Hello, is anyone out there? I think he wants us to know that he alone is God. There is no one his equal. As a matter of fact, compared to him, we're seen as grasshoppers. We're definitely struck in these verses with the immense distance between us and God, a distance of power of wisdom, of ability, of majesty. The gap is truly too great to measure. And then in verse 26, he says, Lift up your eyes on high and see who created the stars. The one who leads them forth by number, he calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Now, if nothing else will convince us of his greatness, examining the wonders of the universe should do it. Are we starting to get the picture? God is so other than us, so big, so vast, so awesome, that we truly cannot fully comprehend the depth of who he is. That's why we so often can't understand why God does and what he does in our world. It's because he's God and we're not. But if we ended our lesson here, we would be tempted to see God, yes, as powerful and mighty, but perhaps too distant and far off. Like he's a bit too fierce to know and too unfathomable to approach. So even though he is indeed an awesome God, we need to remember that he has another arm as well, an arm that gently carries his own, like a shepherd carries his lambs in his bosom. We are again reminded of God's other arm at the end of this passage. These verses are so beautiful and so comforting that it's my prayer that you'll not only recognize his strength and power, yes, but experience the presence of his tremendous peace and comfort as well. So let's read these final verses in Isaiah 40. I'll start with verse 27 and read to the end of the chapter. Why do you say, 
My way is hidden from the Lord, and justice do me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow tired and weary and vigorous men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Again, God speaks through Isaiah and asks the Israelites and asks us as well, why do you say I don't care about you or see your plight? Why do you say it seems like I have forgotten you? It's like God is saying, I understand there may be circumstances that tempt you to doubt me, but remember this and take heart. I will never forget you. Though you grow tired and weary and often lose hope, I never grow tired and weary. I don't ever feel overwhelmed like you so often do. So my children, wait on me. My friends, do you want your strength renewed? Do you desire the kind of peace and power an eagle experiences when it takes flight? Then learn to wait. You say, but I don't want to wait. I don't know how to wait. I don't have time to wait. Please, God, don't make me wait. And yet, you know what? Learning to wait is a necessary and vital part of maturing in him. It's never easy to wait on him, but one thing's for certain. It's much easier to do so when we're captivated by the greatness of God and convinced he is who he says he is. So as we close, let's look at what it means to wait. I think Andrew Murray defines it well in his little book, Waiting on God. He says, To wait is to give full consent that God should deal with us in such a way and time as he deems best. To wait is to experience a great stillness of soul before God that sinks into its own helplessness until he chooses to reveal himself. To wait is to experience a deep humility that is afraid to let its own will or own strength work except as God wills and wants to do of his good pleasure. To wait is the meekness that is content to be and to know nothing except as God chooses to reveal it. And then to wait is the entire resignation of the will that only desires to be a vessel in which his holy will can move. You know, when we look at this evil world around us, we're tempted to ask, what on earth was God thinking? But now that we've come to the end of our first lesson, I hope we'll ask instead, oh God, what do you see from your perspective as almighty God and loving shepherd that I cannot see? Teach me to wait on you and see life from your perspective. Life will make so much more sense when we begin to scrutinize things through the lens of the Almighty. May this then be a good beginning of our study as we become, Lord willing, more and more captivated by the greatness of God. Let's pray together. 
We exalt you, O God, above all other gods and realize that our lives are in your hands. Captivate us with your greatness and love so we can see our lives and our suffering from your perspective and learn what it means to wait on you. Go before us this week as we remember the truths we've learned today and use your word to renew our strength. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.